All right, let's go ahead and get this started. My name is Joe Piverunas. I'm the founder and managing editor of Nanolize. We're a boutique media and research firm that covers disruptive technology for an audience of institutional retail investors across the globe. Today, what we're going to talk about is something a little bit different from what we're usually on here talking about, which is dividend growth investing. Now, just because we focus on tech stocks doesn't mean that we're not doing other things. And one of the activities that we've been involved in over the past decade is building a dividend growth investing strategy called Quantigent. So what we're going to do in today's presentation is show you a tool, a free tool that we've built that will help you put together your own dividend growth investing portfolio. We'll talk about why you might want to do that. And of course, we're eager to hear your questions and comments. You can just post them. Uh, since this is a YouTube video, just post them down there on YouTube. Feedback's always welcomed, and we encourage people to uh, critically examine the theories that we're going to present today. So start by talking a little bit about what is Quantigens. The simplest description is if you look at where we've put our money. So this is a asset class allocation chart. So we're managing assets here at Nanalyze, and we've allocated those across a number of strategies. You can see Nanalyze here at 22%. That number is actually lower than that. So tech stocks have been uh, plummeting off a cliff, as you know. So I think that number is more around 18%. But the number that hasn't changed, it's probably grown to 54, 55%, is the tallest bar you see here, Quantigence. That's a dividend growth investing portfolio that more than half of our assets have been placed in. And simply put, what we've done there is we've looked at companies that have not only paid a dividend, but increased a dividend for at least 25 years in a row. Those are called dividend champions. Once a company has that track record where they've done something for 25 years in a row, it's highly likely they'll continue to keep doing that. So in order for us to even consider a company for inclusion in that portfolio, they have to have paid and increased their dividend for at least 25 years in a row. That's how you get into the universe. Once we have that universe, then we start to rank order the stocks based on the strength of the company, based on the company's capability to keep increasing that dividend over time. And we reward those companies that increase the dividend with the highest growth rate. So in order to rank the stocks and look to how they relatively perform, we put, we put together what's called a Q score. Now, before we get into that, I wanted to talk about why we built Quantigence. And this was born from when we sat down around the middle of our careers and said, gee, when retirement comes, there's a big problem that nobody seems to be talking about. And the problem is this. When you retire, you'll usually get some sort of fixed income, right? That's literally the definition of fixed income. Like bonds is a fixed amount of money that you're receiving at regular intervals. So the income stream that you receive when you retire for most people doesn't change as you age. That's a big problem. Let's say you retire when you're 65 and you live 30 years, okay? When you're 95, the purchasing power of that fixed income stream has halved. Why? Inflation, right? As, as time goes on, things get more expensive. The purchasing power of your dollar falls. So who the hell wants to live a retirement where every year your quality of life decreases? It's bad enough your health's decreasing every year. Do you really want your quality of life decreasing? That sounds miserable. So we didn't like that. And then, of course, you can always increase the income you're paying yourself over the years to offset inflation, but then you're going to run out of capital quite quickly. So we wanted a strategy that not only increased your income over time, but also appreciated your capital. Now, I know that's certainly asking a lot, right? And then, of course, we wanted a strategy that would be resilient in times of economic turmoil. And as we're going to show you in a bit, this strategy works quite well for that. So what we ended up looking at was dividends, the power of dividend growth, okay? So this chart could be any dividend stock. It could be the overall market. When you start to look at the contributions to total return of dividends over time, they become extremely significant as time goes on. That's the power of compounding. So you see here that the return for, I believe this is, um, could be Altria. This is a firm that had a uh, just 
around a 4,000% return without dividends and an 18,000% return with dividends. So you can see that the longer that you hold a stock, the more the dividend contributes to the total return. So we built this strategy. Uh, myself and Peter Vito, who is our head of research, we used to work for, let's say we served time in some of the more infamous financial institutions in America, and we built this strategy. So if you ever see the movie Papillon, that was kind of me and Peter in that raft escaping the clutches of the um, the, uh, uh, the corporate talons. And we went away and started our own shtick, right? So we have Nanalyze that we're building as a uh, in, an investment research firm around technology. And of course, Quantigence we're building out now as well. And we built this strategy. I wanted to show you the power of an income stream that grows at 9%. Um, interestingly enough, this is actually the average 10-year growth of the 30 stocks in our dividend growth portfolio. On average, they increased their dividend by 9% every year for the past 10 years. That's remarkable, right? This is what a growing income stream looks like over time. So year zero, you're at $1,000 a month, fine. Year one, 1,090, right? Year two, 1,188. So not too much exciting things happening. But look at year 30. On year 30, when your income, your fixed income, the power would be halved, you're actually receiving $13,268 a month. Now, that, of course, needs to take into account inflation as well. But you're well outpacing inflation with an income stream that's growing at 9%. So that shows you the power of... Having a retirement where the amount of money that you receive every year increases, I, that's very powerful. Now, Warren Buffett was somebody who used this strategy to become one of the most wealthiest people on this planet. And the concept that I wanted to familiarize you with is called yield on cost, and it's quite simple and powerful. So Warren Buffett spent, and again, these numbers are taken from somebody else. So if they're wrong, then that's that person's fault. But this is roughly to show an example. So the cost basis was $1.3 million. That's what Buffett bought $400 million uh, or 400 million shares in Coke at $3.25 a share. So that's what his purchase was. All right. So he's got that. And we know today what Coke trades, what, $30, $40, $50. I'm not even sure what the price of Coca-Cola is today. But let's say it's $40 a share. That's capital appreciation. Everybody would love to have bought a company at $3.25 a share, and then it trades at $40 a, a share today, right? So he's made that capital appreciation. That's not the cool part. Here's the cool part. So in 2020, Coke paid $1.64 per share in dividends. What does that mean? It means that Buffett is getting back every year 50% of the money that he originally put in. Think about that. Like he has, he has <laughs> the amount of return that he is generating that is above that capital appreciation is simply remarkable. So the yield he's getting on that original capital, 50% yield, that's crazy. So as time goes on, because you only put a fixed amount of money in, but that income keeps growing, that dividend keeps growing, right, over time, your yield starts to go up quite sharply. So that concept is known as yield on cost. Now, what we've put together for everybody is the web, is a website around Quantigence, and you can go there right now, www.quantigence.com. We've got a bit of information there on you know, how dividend growth investing works, a little bit of a guide, but we've put together this calculator, and that's what I wanted to share with everybody because it's, it's now in beta form. Let's say it's a strong beta. Uh, the data's been verified as accurate, and it, what it does is it ranks 70-ish, around 70, dividend growth stocks based on their Q score. So that's the strength of the company in not only paying, but increasing their dividend over time. And we're going to talk about how we calculate those Q scores. But this calculator, you can go pull it up right now. You see there's a little drop down there where you can choose sectors, or you can just choose all, and then you can sort on these different columns. And the one to sort on is Q-score because that will show you how all these companies rank. Now, let's talk about what a Q-score is, all right? When we're looking at a dividend growth stock and we want to try to compare it to other dividend growth stocks, there are a number of factors we look at. Now, the first one is how many years have you increased your dividend? 
you have to have increased it at least 25 years in a row to even get into the universe. So that's a, that's a given. Now, the more years that a company increases their dividend, the more we reward them. That contributes to the Q score. Then we look at the size of a company. Bigger is better. That's economies of scale. That's a no-brainer. All right. So we reward bigger companies. Yield. Higher is better, but that's a little bit tricky, and, and we'll touch on that a little bit later, why that is. But um, what we'll do with that factor is if a company has less than 1% yield, we actually penalize them because this is about income, right? So we want a portfolio that has stocks that pay us income. So it, if it's not meaningful, then it needs to be given less priority, okay? Because this is just a way to rank and prioritize companies. So the higher the yield, the higher the score we give them. Now, as I said, we're going to talk about that in a little bit because a higher yield isn't necessarily better and AT&T investors will know what I'm talking about. Then we look at payout ratio. This is simply the percentage of a company's profits that are being paid out to investors in the form of dividends. So the reason why this is important is if you're a company that pays 20% of your profits out in dividends and you have 80% left over, that's a huge buffer. So even if your profits plummet, you still have a buffer where you can keep increasing your dividend over time. So when a company has too high of a payout ratio and they're paying you know, 95% of their profits and dividends, how sustainable is that, right? So that's something that we look at. And then international sales, that avoids domestic bias. We like companies that have international sales. We penalize, or so we don't reward companies that, that have no international sales. Then we reward you know, five-year dividend growth, 10-year dividend growth, and um, we don't reward uh, unless they they're, they're have some meaningful growth. So the aggregate of all these factors produces a Q score, and then that Q score can be used to rank companies. Here we've done that in the consumer discretionary space. We've ranked the five companies in our universe, McDonald's, excellent dividend growth stock, Lowe's and VFC, and then Target and GPC. So you can see how all these rank. Uh, one example here would be look at Lowe's, the second uh, column there, and then look at the international sales row. You see how that's at a two? That's because Lowe's doesn't actually have any international sales, so they're not rewarded for that. Same thing with Target and GPC, whilst McDonald's actually has quite a bit of international sales because they sell things around the globe. So this is just an example of how for each of these factors, there's a um, number that then goes into calculating the total Q score. Now, if you're going to use that calculator to build your own portfolio, and that's what this is about, there's a number of things you need to consider. And the first fundamental question is, well, how many stocks do you want to hold? And there are different theories around how many stocks give you an idea, ideal diversification. We're holding 30 stocks, for example. Then you need to consider yield. Now, our portfolio yield is quite low on the tin. Remember we talked about yield on cost? Our yield on cost is a lot higher than the, the yield of our portfolio, which is around 2.5%. That's quite low. Well, you build your own portfolio, you can leave out stocks with lower yields and put in ones with higher yields, all right? Industry diversification. Um, this is something that you need to consider, and we considered this strongly when putting together our own portfolio. We wanted to make sure that we were spread out across all available 11 available industries. And then time to vest. The best way this works is if you're somebody in the middle of your career and you're making a decent salary and you're socking away 50% of that every month because you're living below your means, and then you're buying all the stocks in your portfolio every month. And you've also turned on drips, dividend reinvesting, so that the dividends being paid in that portfolio are going right into buying more shares. And you do that for a decade and then see where you're at, right? So that, it, or if you're somebody that says, and we have people that come to us and say, well, I've got you know 10K or 100K or 500K and I wanna put it into the strategy. How do I go about doing that? Well, we're gonna talk about how you first would select the stocks using the calculator, select your own stocks and your own convictions, right? And then you would probably want to buy them at intervals to avoid trying to time the market. You don't just go buy all your stocks all at one time. You may set a period of time like six months and then every month buy a sixth of your total position size, right? That's called dollar cost averaging. So these are all things to consider when you're putting together your portfolio. When it comes to the number of stocks you should hold at least 20, at least that's what the academics tell us when it comes to the optimal number of stocks for diversification. 
uh, 20, they say at least. So what we could do then is we could take the top 20 stocks using that calculator. We could take the top 20 stocks and just invest in those. So we did that. We took the top 20 stocks and we broke them out. And here are the industries for those stocks. We have five in industrials, five in consumer staples, four in financials, two energy, and, and the list goes on. So what if we just took the top industries and invested in those, industrials, consumer staples, and financials? So what we're doing there, we're investing in the highest Q score stocks in the top three industries, all right? Here's what that portfolio of 14 stocks would look like, right? There's some good names in here. And in green are stocks that we're holding. The first thing that is quite remarkable is if you look at the year's increasing dividend. So the average year's increasing dividend in this list is nearly 50 years. That's a long time. They've been paying out and increasing a dividend for 50 years. So then when you when you go through this list, then you might see where, where you might wanna start making some tweaks. So for example, we wouldn't hold PepsiCo and Coca-Cola in a strategy and we're not. And that's because these companies do similar things. So you'd probably want to choose what. And then when it comes to like Franklin Resources and T-Row, these are also similar asset managers. You may only want to hold one. Now, if you took that approach, you vested in these 14 stocks, you'd also be missing out on some good names. So if we include the other six stocks in the top 20 list, here's what we have. Some Johnson & Johnson at the top, probably the best stock to own. If, if you asked us, I can only hold one stock, what stock would that be? J&J. There's a lot of reasons for that, but it's an incredibly strong and resilient company that's built quite well. It's built to last. So Johnson & Johnson it should, belongs, in our opinion, in any dividend growth portfolio. And so does McDonald's. That's another great firm, right? So these are the rest of the companies that would be on that list. So you indeed then could say, well, maybe I'll just take the top 20 companies, but then you also want to consider things like oil companies, for example. So when you're looking at that calculator, there's some names in there that may that you may want to look at subjectively. AT&T is a good example. They're supposed to have a corporate event next year, and there's questions around whether or not they're going to lose their dividend champion status. So that's one thing we're keeping an eye on. Energy companies. When the price of oil went negative because of the Rona, energy companies got hit hard. Those yields went through the roof, but also that's because the stock prices uh, went to the floor. So you need to consider that, you know, oil is a touchy subject. That's not just because of ESG. That's also because it's, it's a commodity and in the price of that commodity is quite volatile. Now, Exxon is actually pretty resilient. They have an incredible business model. We'll probably do a research piece on it at some point. And then you have Chevron. I remember when there was the last oil crisis, they had the first slide of their investor deck was that growing the dividend is the single most important thing for us. So once these companies have those track records, they don't want to break them. Then you have Walgreens Boots Alliance, so Walgreens in the States, when I go there to visit, um, you walk into Walgreens, it's the smell of death. You know, when, you're, when you start to rent space to Amazon in your foyer, you know, you're kind of, you're kind of giving up. So, so Walgreens is running into a problem with Amazon and Walmart, and how is Walgreens going to compete with all that overpriced junk they sell? I don't know, but I'm sure that the company's management team has a strategy to pull themselves out of whatever situation they find themselves in. So. When you're looking at what companies to include, you ought to not just make it rules-based, but also take somewhat of a subjective approach to it. Now, just going back to Johnson & Johnson real quick, here's a 40-year chart. And you know, some of these companies, we've held Johnson & Johnson forever now, and, and it's there's nothing exciting. You don't go check Johnson & Johnson's share price every day. There's nothing happening there. It's rather quite boring. But I'll tell you where it gets really exciting, and that's when you see tech stocks plummet. And then you go look at your dividend growth portfolio, or you look at the checks that arrive every month, and you see these numbers going up over time, and you see all that income pouring in. You look at beautiful charts like this that show the appreciation of an asset that is also paying you a raise every single year for over 50 years. It's remarkable. So this strategy is very powerful. And you know the old quote, it's about time in the market, not timing the market. When you put this strategy in place and you allocate your capital and you give it some time, it's quite remarkable what you can accomplish. Now, what we've built is we've taken data, we've licensed data from a NASDAQ subsidiary and we've licensed that data so we can build products around it. So we pay a 
a, a pretty decent fee for that privilege. And we're now able to create a strategy and a product using the raw data. So we're building everything from the ground up. Here's an example of this massive spreadsheet that we work with whenever we do a data refresh. And Peter uh, puts that together and, and works with his team on, on building this. And there's a lot of work that goes into it. So when you go to the website, Quantigent's website, and you go to that calculator, that's being powered by data that we've licensed. Now, what we do is we'll take that twice a year, we'll take that data, and that's sourced right from companies SEC filings where it should be sourced from. And then we'll draw a market cap cutoff. So we'll leave out companies that don't meet a certain size threshold. And then we'll perform a series of QA steps to make sure that we don't have any data errors. And we actually managed to find a fair number of data errors from, from the vendor, uh, incorrect data, just based on the rigorous QA that we've applied. So we're actually improving the product that we're purchasing. So um, once we've done that, then all that data then powers our calculator and we're able to calculate the Q scores and that's free for everybody to use and you can go play with at any time. Now what we're building, there is no such thing as a free lunch of course and we want to build something much bigger around this strategy. So for example, we may expand the universe for that calculator by adding all the smaller ex -stock stocks that we were excluding. A lot of people have asked us around about foreign dividend growth stocks, that could be something we're adding. So. If you're a subscriber to Quantigence, then maybe the calculator, these additional features become available. Maybe we're also going to make available dividend increase alerts. So that's something that I would personally find very useful. Holding dividend, 30 dividend growth stocks, I want an email every time one increases their dividend. And I, I don't just want to know about the increase. How much was that increase compared to last time? What were their last five or 10 increases like? On app, what's the average increase, right? So all these metrics and that can be automated, which is very powerful. Once you have that data that you can create automation around it. So we, whenever we refresh the data, we can then also make observations about how Q scores change over time. There's a lot of analytics we can do by looking at our universe. How interesting would it be to look at the companies that fell out, right? We probably learned something. So we'll, we'll probably do, start producing research around that, you know, articles about stocks. Remember I said Exxon's business model would be interesting to look at around industries. And then of course, ETFs. Now that's something that this strategy lends itself very well to is a potentially an ETF. And that's something that we're presently looking at. And that's all part of the, the um, roadmap that we, we have in place for Quantigens. Now, the other thing I would say is that when we calculate those Q scores, those are all rules-based. So you can see here, we've put up the formula for calculating the, the Q score contribution for 10-year growth. Well, what we may look to do over time when we consult with our clients is perhaps changing some of these. Now, they, as I said, they've been rigorously developed and tested over the past decade, but there are still some improvements. For example, we're looking at perhaps capping the reward that a company gets for yield. So we may reward them all the way up to, let's say a 5% yield, and then not re reward past that. That's to take into account situations, for example, what happened with oil when the yield for Exxon and Chevron spiked, that wasn't necessarily a good thing. Those people were quite worried about those companies when that happened. So we don't want to reward the increase of yield too much and, and it becomes, quite tricky. So that's an example of a change that we might make to our strategy based on consultations we have with our clients. So um, the other last thing I'll leave you with, of course, is uh, the, the short sales pitch that we've put together a report on how we've built our DGI strategy, which details everything. It details the how and why, and then it also looks at how we went through, built our own portfolio uh, using some objectivity and some subjectivity and you can see that in how we've how we've put that together and then of course it shows all 30 dividend growth stocks that we're currently invested in so in order to get access to this report we've made this available to analyze premium subscribers that's the only way to access this and in the future we'll we may make this available via a subscription on quantigence but for now the only way that you can get that is by becoming a nanalyze premium annual member so We'll go ahead and leave you with that. Thanks for taking the time to attend this. Hope it's useful. If you have any questions, just leave them in the comments section. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channels. We will be putting out more videos like this as time goes on. So thanks very much for your time.